returning for the third and final Dr. Bruce talk from the Palenque Norte tent and Camp Soft Landing at Burning Man 2013, we take up one of the most important themes I have ever addressed. The rebalancing of the feminine in the world as a force to recenter the course of our crazily careening civilization. I served up a fanciful yet provocative story based partly on profound new scientific discoveries, stirred together with a healthy dollop of imagination. This is the story of one of the most important figures in our deep human prehistory, a woman known and named through her universal gene signature, Mitochondrial Eve. Mitochondrial Eve is the true mother of us all, and each of us carries her within. Traveling back 180,000 years, we enter the Blombos Caves of coastal South Africa, where among the ash layers we find surprisingly high-tech tools, mysteriously marked bones, and the earliest evidence of us modern humans. Was mitochondrial Eve born in the Blombos Caves? Was she truly different? Possibly super advanced? As she was growing up, how did the other women treat her? And how did she impact the other men? Then, how did her singular influence echo down through history? And is she now making her return? What I'm going to bring to you is a special story. And it's a kind of a story that I think that we need for our civilization right now. I think if you're going to transform a world, you uh, need to tell better stories. As soon as the monkey gets a good story inside of her or him, then transformation starts. My talk yesterday at Fractal Planet was about how the monkey brain fully turned on with imagination and vision and stimulants and meditation and practices. It's a powerful tool that is so powerful it can visualize whole worlds that then reverberates out into the universe and the universe starts to provide the steps to get to that world. So that was the Fractal Planet talk. How many were you at, at Fractal Planet? So these are fractal planetarians. So the story I want to tell you is actually the meta story around the fractal planet talk. Because we sit here in the in the early 21st century and we sort of sort of think of our lives in like the last 20 years, that's the time frame. And oh, we're not making progress, or oh, things are getting worse, because news media tells us the bad stories all the time. And so we're in this little compressed thing. Think of as though you were in the largest shoe store in the world, but you lived in one shoe box with a pair of pumps. So your entire world was this pumped up world or this pumped down world, or, but you don't know that there's all these other shoe boxes. And you don't know that those shoes in that store have a 100,000 year history of shoes. The shoes are made out of you know, leather thongs and earlier stuff. So we all have this limited perspective and then our perspective is further limited by our life experiences. So this is where a story can help because story, as you know from your kindergarten years, a good storyteller in the kindergarten, a good teacher, could really immerse you. You know, you you were possibly more immersed in a story being read in the classroom by a parent or by an aunt or an uncle or grandmother or grandfather than any media since. Human consciousness and culture probably began to tell story. So the caves of Lascaux are these immense painted landscape, but it turns out it's a star map. Did you know that? That the bullhorns are points in the sky, in the night sky of the time of Lascaux. So they put hundreds or thousands of, of years into making that theater to then have the shaman of the shamaness take the tallow lamp and, and move it around and color up and light up and smoke up the environment and tell the story of the culture. But they were actually telling the story of the universe, not just of the hunt. It was much bigger than we, we know. So we're storytelling beings. 
So if you want to change the world, you actually have to ask yourself, if we're story containers, if we're story suckers, if we're story meme mimetic transmitters, what are the stories that are going through the world now? Those stories that are going through the world, they're very malleable. We see them in social media, we see them in culture and religion. But those are what make our reality. Terence McKinney used to talk about language. You know, we're a world made out of language. And I kind of never quite grokked it until I sort of understood what Terence was really meaning was it's a world made out of story. Is that that I could grok, my kindergarten mind could get that. So here's a story, and it's a story that I think uh, the kind of stories we should be telling ourselves now. Very hopeful story, very thought-provoking story, and a new story, but a story that goes over a very long time frame, and a story that can tell us where we might be going. And an element about this story is that it's based in science. You know, you think, oh no, science, you know, my half my brain just turned off, you know. Nightmares of the classroom and trying to get one beaker to pour into another and all those things. No, no, no. This is not that. There's going to be any equations here. You know, they, they tell you, as a science writer, they tell you a, a single equation or even a single Greek character within a book will cut its sales by 50%. So I'm very, very cautious about the uh, you know, those things creeping in, um, Greeking in. So the story is it's very, very Burning Man. It's very dirty. It's very expressive. So if you go to South Africa, South Africa is one of the most amazing places in the world. California, I used to think, was incredibly vibrant and dynamic and trippy and all that because it had like, environments kind of like, like this and have everything. Till I went to South Africa. South Africa just blows your socks off, your proverbial, you know, giraffe socks off. It's an astounding place. There's some incredible power to it. And you go to the south coast of South Africa, and there's this incredibly rich marine environment, just like the Monterey Bay where I live, but there's penguins standing around. You know? And the penguins are like pointing toward Antarctica because that's where they're headed. This is Africa, you know, incredibly rich environment. Well, it turns out in the last 20 years, archaeologists have found human remains, settlements, etc., of possibly our very first modern humans in South Africa. We always sort of think of old Vigors and all that. That's way back, and that's real proto-human material. South Africa may be the place where we came to consciousness. And there's a particular cave called Lombos Cave on the south coast of South Africa where they have found implements, tools, necklaces, you know, a counting system, an astronomical system scratched into bones. It's a phenomenal thing. And this thing is 160, 180,000, 200,000 years ago. Amazing. It's totally amazing. Now, at the same time as all this is going on, the, the genetic paleo detectives have gone through our genes, and you, you can you can send a bunch of spittle in a tube for 99 bucks. Six weeks later, you find out where your ancestors came from. And when I got my chart, it showed these blotches moving up out of East Africa through Iran into Europe and blotching out in Iceland and Ireland and France for both the matrilineal and the, the patriarchy, the line of the father. It's fantastic. This realization is now emerging for everyone. Everyone can get this done. So all of this is happening, and uh, along the way to the gene farm, they discover that we all have the same gene, the same gene coding for the mitochondria, which is a very important sort of energy center in your cell. And this is only possible if we have a common mother. So they said, oh, this can't be. You know, this just can't be. So they started sampling all over the world, Australian Aboriginal peoples, people in, the, in Siberia, people of different branches, and they find the same mitochondrial stamp. So it's like they can't find anyone who doesn't have this gene. So the conclusion has to be we come from one woman, one incredible woman. Now, the genetic detectives do their work and they run their little genetic clocks and their, their predictive algorithms and they can actually kind of figure out where that happened. 
roughly, and they think it's around 160 to 200,000 years ago. The, the mother of us all, who they call mitochondrial Eve, that's a kind of a catchy name, you know, for her. So it possibly means that she lived in South Africa. And why do we know this? There's a third set of detectives out there called climatologists. And they look around and they, they study layers of dust and low S and things like that to try to figure out when, what the climate was like. They are the third piece of the puzzle. It turns out that between 180, 200,000 years ago, Africa was whacked. East Africa was dried out. It was a little bit like the Sahara. You know, the rainforest had been cut off from our ancestors by the Rift Valley, the Serpentine Valley going up and down. So us, us peoples, us non-forest dwelling people, were in trouble. Eastern Africa was really a mess. The old Avai Gorge area, where we find the bones of ancestors millions of years old, you couldn't live there now. They couldn't live there now. It's just it's horrific. It's 120 degrees Fahrenheit there all the time. So Africa was really messed up. So the third part of it is, maybe there weren't that many people left. Maybe we almost went extinct. So you put it all together, and you get what you call a genetic neck where you come down to a really small population, like the sea lions on the coast of California, the bull elephant seals, there were only 30 left when the hunting stopped. And they survived on this island, and then the population has come back. So all the California bull elephant seals are all really closely related, but they almost went extinct. This happened to us. Can you imagine? We could have been reduced to a community as small as 30 people, 30 humans in the world left of, of the line that became us. Now put three and three together and go back to the Blombos cave and you can Google this and, and Wikipedia this and see this place. What if they were living there? 30 of them, it seems like that was about the size of the community. They were living in this cave and they were living a, a pretty good life because their ancestors had come through the Swaziland, through KwaZulu Natal from Kenya in East Africa, where it's becoming harder and harder and harder to make a living. Harder and harder to get that gazelle and to make a catch and to find water and to find plants. And so they've arrived in South Africa and they changed their diet. They had to. So their diet is now shellfish, fish if they can catch them, if they have the technology. A lot of shellfish, seaweed, super high omega kind of things. Really quite a good diet actually. And the environment that they're in is not a hunting environment, it's really a pure gathering environment. When you study communities of people who live by the seashore, what do you find? You know, mellow surfers in Santa Cruz, uh, pretty cool ouzo drinking fishermen in, in Greece, you know, good sashimi, sashimi, sushi, uh, you know, Zen uh, Japanese running their fishing boat. You find peaceable communities. Fishing communities are peaceable. Why? Because the ocean is so much bigger than anything that humans can do. The ocean dominates. It's mother. It's a giant. And it's a constant soothing cycle. You're tied to the rhythms of the waves. And you're at the behest of the animals that live there to feed you. It's a harvest environment rather than a hunt. It's not a violent environment. So wrap that all together, those four pieces, and put yourself back in Blombos Cave, 200,000 BC, and what happens there? A genetic mutation. Call it God. Call it dumb luck. Call it provenance. She is born. Mitochondrial Eve is born. She is different. How different is she? How more powerful is she? Now you'd say, well, maybe she just didn't have hair, or maybe she had a better voice box. You know, and this is what a reductionist scientist would say. Somehow she had some small trait that was beneficial. I don't buy that. You know why I don't buy that? Because her genes marched on through the world in every living hominid, whether it be our direct ancestor species lines or different hominid lines, including Neanderthals, they were doomed. Her genetic mutation, her genes were so powerful that every living proto-hominid on the planet was doomed at that point. They didn't survive. Not one of them survived. You only survived if you mated with 
an individual who carried mitochondrial Eve. Otherwise, nothing made it through. You know, there was a population on the Earth 200,000 years ago. It wasn't small. They didn't make it. So this gene, mitochondrial Eve, was a super being. She not only probably lacked hair or some other trait like that that mattered later, you know, just these physical traits, she had a mind. She had a mind like no other. She had a conscious mind. She possibly had language like no other, but she had multiple mutations. She was a transposition of the species in multiple facets up to a, a spot that had never been seen before. So put yourself sitting around the fire in Blombos Cape, and this little baby's there. It's kind of a funny looking baby, but the women are drawn to this baby. The women take care of this baby. The women do not allow the young boys to abuse the baby. No way. They take her in. They know she's special. The males don't know whose baby it is because no one's figured that out. There is no patrilineal lineage and ownership of or property or chattel of humans yet because nobody knows whose child that is. No one ever has. So as she grows up, then she becomes a woman. Can you imagine what she's like? She starts inventing stuff. I bet you she invented one of the most powerful things. I bet you she invented language so that they could have gossip. So instead of just sitting around and making a sound, making another sound, she said, we got to get more down than this. There's a lot more to say about those men. And so I'm going to invent language so we can talk about them behind their backs. So she invented gossip. She may have invented things like cooking, for goodness sakes. You know, those scratches in, in the, the bones, the bone fragments and the ochre in Blombo's cave, she may have done those. She may have showed them, oh, here's how you mark the cycles of the calendar. Here's how we're going to figure out, if they bring back the shellfish and you count it out, there should be a fairer system. So-and-so just keeps going and grabbing all the muscles. No, 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 no. So she invented the legal code. She might have invented song. She might have been hearing birds one day and said, we can entertain ourselves with song. We can sound like a bird. Let's try it. We don't have to just gossip. So this community was rocking. You know, it became a party. And the most important thing she may have invented, which led to potentially the most dangerous consequence, is she started studying the night sky. She's like an Einstein, right? She's like celestial too. So she's watching the moon, scratching in the ochre. They can't quite figure out when a year has gone by, but she works it out. She invents the calendar. Okay, see this, this thing here that I'm gonna lay on this shrine with the scratches, that's calendar. And so the moon should be getting full soon. At the same time, then she starts getting into healthcare. For example, she gets older, she gives birth. She gives birth maybe to two girls, maybe two twin girls, something like that. And these twin girls are also special. And no one knows who the father really is, etc., etc. So she studies these twin girls. And as they start to menstruate, they go into that whole cycle. She says, wait a minute. Their cycle is matched to my little scratches. They're matched to the moon. This is interesting. So there's the gossip, 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 gossip. Oh yeah, mine seem to be matched to the moon too. In fact, mine are the same as yours. And they're all the same as the moon. And then one day they have a lunar eclipse and that blows their minds, but she says, don't panic. You know, this is a sign there's something else going on. We'll work it out in the future. Can't figure that one out. But she's incredible, so she works that out. In the middle of all this, the males are sort of sitting around. You know, the males, they're gophers. They go and they get shelters. They go and they do this, etc., etc. And with the rise of Eve, they are kind of getting in more and more of the back seat. They can't understand the gossip, for one, which is, as we men know, is endlessly frustrating. We can't understand what's being said about us. Uh, but they start getting very jealous of her. They start getting upset. And then one day, somehow, the greatest secret in history to that point is let loose. Perhaps the most conniving, devious male, the, the, the first uh, male spy in history, decides he's going to hide himself while they're talking and try to work out what they're talking about. And mitochondrial Eve is holding up the calendar thing and saying, well, you know, now that we know when we can get baby on these cycles, didn't you just sleep with the scraggly hairy guy 
whatever his name is. Now, they've given these guys names they didn't have names before. You know, oh, yeah, yeah, and uh, I feel big. Aha. We may now be able to figure out what is baby, where baby come from. And this guy is under the table, or he's in, you know, it's behind the curtain, listing baby. That's my baby inside her. Aha. Uh -huh. Now, what does this do to the male mind? He goes back to the other man and says, ha ah, ha ha ha, you. I have my own baby. Are you crazy? You can't, you can't have a baby. You're, you're one of us scraggly dudes that just goes and kicks muscles off the beach. You know, you're, you're just a wretch like us. No, no, no. I, I tell you when my baby comes. You know? So he has some kind of power. He has information, he has power. And he's right. The baby pops out, it looks like his, has his, his uh, ridiculous shapely nose, and they're going, belongs to you. That child belongs to you. Now the child no longer belongs to the community. It belongs to this dude, right? This is a huge change. This is a change that unravels history. So that's mine. So the other guys are like, well, uh, I want mine too. Now that you know, this dude, he knows that's his kid, he just grabs this kid at a certain age and makes him his own, puts him next to him. This is the beginning of the army. This is the beginning of, of male power in the face of the frustration with true female genius. And the women in mitochondrial Eve are still saying to these men, oh please, oh please. That's pretty much what they say to them. But they don't know what's going on. They don't know the devious planning of these frustrated males. Only one or two of them can grok the math of the lunar cycle, but you know, they manage to work it out. So it goes on and on until one day the males decide to kind of mount a little bit of an insurrection. They start starting to push for their power. How do they push for their power? In a state like this where the female has been the center of the community, the female has been sitting there building the heart, doing the cooking, doing the gossiping, doing the, the information, they're the network. The males are these sort of isolated entities. They build their own combine. They're supposed to bring a lot of the food in. The, male, the females can do that too. The males are a little bit superfluous. So the males, one of them says that in their religion, very, very early religion, bloodletting is the, one of the most sacred things. The, the seeing of blood, the blood that comes out, is one of the most powerful things. For them, that's energy, that's chi, that's everything. Women bloodlet. Therefore, women have power. Women can bloodlet and not die. They do it every month. So that was the symbol of their ultimate authority before language. So the young guy that's, that's so frustrated and so angry goes into the bush, he goes into the forbidden regions, which are starting to recover to the north, and he takes up the spear again. And these men have not been doing animal killing for a long time. He fashions a spear. He probably fashions it from something mitochondrial Eve invented, like the arrow tip. Like, let's invent a sharp object to cut oysters open. And this guy you know, steals one one day from the kitchen cabinet, lashes it to something saying, oh, I can make a missile. Initially, I'll do it so I can poke the, the asses of the other males and have some fun, but then he realizes he could kill with this thing because they've forgotten all their previous culture. There's only 30 of them left. There's no other culture. There's dangerous people in the interior. There's other proto-humans that are not like them that will cut their heads off. It's really dangerous times. Very violent world. So he goes, he creeps into the bush and he kills the sacred kudu, the most sacred animal that the community has. And it's this wonderful antelope with an incredible curving horn. I saw one in South Africa when I was there 10 years ago. And he brings the head back, all dripping with blood, and he holds it up as an affront to the women and to the whole community. I have let blood. I am powerful. And mitochondrial Eve, of course, goes ballistic because he's, they're trying to preserve the culture and they just see this as just out of control, this, just, just renegadism. So they say, not just, oh, please, but they read the list of things why this was a bad idea, which are all sensible, which would be sensible today, this list. So mitochondrial Eve's list 
about bloodlust, about war, about acting out, about not clearing your feelings, what is going on. She reads this list down, but it goes into deaf ears. Because why? The male has been activated. The male's power has been activated. Because he has this spear. They don't know how he did this. But he even managed to cut the head off. This thing must have taken him like five hours or something pretty difficult. They're not hunters anymore. So roll the, the dice forward. Now the male power is activated. The males are, are, are all in this whole frenzy. And they haven't been in this frenzy for a while. And they start to go and hunt more meat. And the meat changes their body content. It changes their hormones. It changes everything about them. It changes them, bolts them up, etc., etc. So the seafood diet, which is very, very healthy, is now being supplemented by raw meat, pretty much. Or if they can figure out how to cook it. So what happens next? What happens next? Can anybody guess? What do jilted suitors, angry husbands do? Oppress the women? Oppress the women. Now, in this case, they can't because the women are just so dominant. But what, what else can they do? What do you see on those emergency signs on the highway all the time around this country? You can you guess? Child abduction. Child abduction. So, one night, you know, there's the two twin girls, the two Eves, Eve 1 and Eve 2. This dude, plus a, a party of the other men, who are now totally pumped up on their kills, kidnap her. They kidnap one of the twin girls, the future child, if you will. And they leave the community because they know they can survive in the interior. And they head north. And then history unravels from there. Because that is the beginning of the split between man and woman. That is the beginning of male discovery of power, this knowledge equal power. That is the beginning of estrangement between the sexes. And that rages for 200,000 years until our time, and it's still raging. Now where do these guys go? They go through the bush, they go up through Eastern Africa, the Rift Valley, they build their own communities, they're back in the hunter-gatherer mode, but they carry her genes. They now have all the genetic advantages that she has. So they somehow managed to raise Eve's daughter, and they are going, they're on the move. But it's a much more divisive community structure. It's still probably more cohesive than ours today. Why do we have to thank that manic monkey for doing that? Because in his mania, in his drive, in his frustration, he carries her genes across the planet. He walks her genes everywhere. Her vitality and her innovation and her genius is carried to the four corners of the earth by this dude and the dude's offspring. And it's an incredibly powerful force. It happens very fast. We're talking 200,000 years ago. They're flooding into Europe by 135,000 years ago. The Neanderthals are under assault. They're flooding into East Asia. You can watch it on your 23andMe gene map. You can watch this incredible tide that moves. So we have to thank the manic male monkey for doing this job. But where does the manic male monkey take this? Well, we all know where the male monkey takes this. Through Rome, through you know the Chinese empires, through the violence of the world's religions that are supposedly based in love, they're always co-opted by manic male energy. Even though they may have a feminine beginning, they're always kidnapped. The future child is always taken from anything that has a Y-centered feminine start. Right? It's always the kidnapping. Always. Except in our time, we're seeing a change. Why are we seeing the change? Rolling your clock back to 1989. How many of you were born after 1989? A few. So I'm really feeling older these days. I was in Eastern Europe. I went and dashed a piece of the Berlin Wall out. I lived in Prague while they were dismantling the Iron Curtain and the nuclear warheads. But you know what those nuclear warheads were? That dude's spear. That dude's spear morphed into the abomination of the nuclear missile. 25, 30, 40,000 of those suckers were built. And in 1989, as the, the Berlin Wall fell, 1991, as the Soviet Union came apart, I was gripping my seat. Because at any moment, that there could have been a salvo launched from a former Soviet republic or a nutty US President Dr. Strangelove or something like that. 
that nuclear war could have happened in those years really easily, and it didn't. Why did it not? Because finally, the male bloodlust had run its course. It had come to the point where if the bloodlust was to be fully expressed, everything was lost. Everything was wiped out, including ego and bloodlust. So you don't want to wipe out your ability to have bloodlust, you know, <laughs> because it's the thing you're after. So in the 1990s, this mycelial layer it bonded together the whole planet. Something's going on here, guys. 1945, 46, 47, the European Union was formed. Why was the European Union formed? I mean, we complain about it. 1945, Europe, roll the clock back, how many cities in ruins? I went to Yugoslavia in 1993, and I saw that, and my European friend says, my god, that's what we were 50 years ago. That's a reminder of where we were in tribal warfare. So the architects of the EU built a single steel industry to link Germany and France to prevent another war. Finally, the males had got it. We just can't go on. We can't do this again. Ironically, Europe is the place where, when our ancestors flowed out of Africa, they were living the longest. That's where the case of Lusco is. That's where human culture was developed. It was in southern Europe into northern Europe. We've been living and warring in Europe longer than any other place. It's the most blood-soaked place on the planet, pretty much. Europe all the way up to the Urals. So maybe we have learned the lesson. Now, another thing in Europe, women in positions of power, women running countries, women in the EU, women everywhere, women rising in Europe, in the oldest place that human culture flourished. And I think that what's happening, and what could be in this century, if we recognize it, is the return of mitochondrial Eve. She's expressing herself. Why? Because the planet's filled up. The planet is no longer frontiers where the males can go and keep their bloodlust going. No, no. The planet is a single hearth now. It's a single hearth, and mitochondrial Eve is walking back onto the stage, and is this crowded hearth. There's seven billion sitting around it, and women are starting to move forward, and they're starting to form the inner circle. You can see this in the Women's Visionary Congress, for example, that, that Annie started. It's part of this camp. They're starting to move into the inner circle and sit down. They're starting to set the dialogue. And mitochondrial Eve is emerging, and she is going to come into that center. And she's going to tell us uh, where we went wrong. She's going to have her list that she read off to the, the crazy dude, why this was a bad idea. She's going to bring this list. It's going to be the greatest list ever. It's better than the you know, ridiculous things like Moses' tablets or stuff read by guys, right? that are just wrong. And so this list, she's going to bring this list, and I said, as I told you before, now that we are 7 billion, here is the list of things that make for a good community. Here's how laws should be. Here's how behavior should be. Don't go and bring me kudu heads anymore that are dripping with blood. Let's return now to the community that we had in the beginning. And I think at this point, we would be wise to listen to her because she's returning. So with that, um, one of the things that I, I thought, and this is for the women of the group to think about, do you feel inside you, do you feel her? Do you feel mitochondrial being? Do you feel the first mother in you? I can't put my hand up. Does anyone feel that for her mother, the energy? Have you seen her in a vision? Has she come to you in any form? Put your hands up if you, there's one. Have you, have you felt her in childbirth? Have you seen her in the eyes of your child, the love that comes through you to your child? Have you seen her in the frustration and anger about what males get down to? In the ocean. In the ocean. What what I would say, suggest, and I, I can't really suggest much because I'm one of those manic males, but I feel a powerful female side to me. I feel a male core, but wrapped in a female shell. And so, and I feel incredible privilege having that been born into me, uh, however it happened. But try to, try to see mitochondrial Eve inside of you. Try, try to see it in the ocean and nature. If rainforest medicines 
thing, one of the interesting things is uh, the medicines of the 60s that activated consciousness, and we know about them, you know, LSD and things like that. Very male, right? Very male. The medicines that are activating consciousness are from the rainforest, and they're extremely female. Is there a reason for this? Well, the vine is growing into the mind of the monkey from the rainforest, and it's dripping some substance that is changing those minds and doing it quickly. So what I think that would possibly be a good idea for the women among us is to think about this story, do a bit of research, look it up online so you can convince yourself this might actually be true. Right? A lot of the stories we tell each other, you know, it's hard to pin them down. But this story has the climatologists behind it, the genetic people behind it, the archaeology behind it, and the and the the history of my human migration behind it. And we'll, we'll hear from Michael later, I'm sure. But even if it's completely wrong, say for instance the story is completely off. Stories are powerful unto themselves. Think of any community that is female-centered in the world, any indigenous community that, that still survives. Study that community. Those communities did exist for hundreds of thousands or maybe millions of years. Study how they operate in, in contrast to uh, male-oriented communities, communities with lots of hierarchy you know, and, and lots of push and shove. And when we come back to the fundamental question of what world we want to make, if we imagine a world that is the seven billion of us, and try to see this when you're out in the playa tonight, when you're walking across the playa, and you see that tremendous colorscape and all these vehicles moving, imagine somehow that that's every human being in the world is here on the playa, all seven billion, everyone is here. Now, of course, we have a man symbol at the center, but we have this incredible circle of energy and unity. And we have the temple, which is a very, very, I think it feels very female. So we have a beautiful balance. Imagine all seven billion of us here. If all seven billion human beings were here, and we were in some kind of incredible shared, not just a party, but a huge opening, everyone would go home and we'd have a changed world. We would go home to, imagine every single human, you go home and there's, the cities are empty, right? There's nobody been there for a week. And, and it's like, everyone's walking around and engineers have still been there to keep the power running and stuff like that, but it's like, the houses are all empty, you know, the cubicles are empty, and we all walk, everyone walks into their office like, look at this shithole we work in. It's like, do you think it's a shithole? Yeah. Do you, do you, do you? Yes, I do. We gotta tear this whole building down, all 50 stories of it. We're not, we're not coming into this building because we were all in this incredible experience and the default world's gone. Can you imagine that? We just decide, you know, we have community meetings, like we've been transformed, we've been out in this place, we've achieved balance, we've achieved vision, and we think our cities are fucking ugly. And we now have to have a plan to take them apart. So we only need one shopping mall, and that's going to be changed. We're going to tear that down, put a park there, et cetera, et cetera. None of that stuff is worth anything. It's only worth to, to feed this maw, this maw of accumulation, which came from male bloodlust and accumulation and beyond measure, the seeking of blood, the seeking of power. So we could just start tearing that shit down, start changing our homes. Wouldn't affect the economy much, it would provide many more jobs. We could start growing more food locally. It'd just all happen overnight, you know? We'd set up a museum where we could go and see what our world used to be like. You know, maybe that museum would like be Las Vegas or something. We'd preserve Las Vegas so we could go and see what our world used to be like. Uh, so with that, we have like five minutes for questions. I would like to take questions initially from the women that are here. Questions are not just questions, but inputs. And the males will be in the end of the queue. Can we do that? Can we agree to that? So if you have a thought, a vision, a story, a dream, and you are, you have the right chromosome. I'm curious, what's the relationship between the mitochondria and the sort of intellectual movement that you're describing, like mitochondria and intelligence? 
That I have no answer for. Um, that's just an unknown. That's an unknown. It's this is all like guesswork. That it seems as though the first modern humans were way down the tip of Africa about that time. This is all guesswork. It could have been other mutations too, along with that mitochondrial mutation. We may never know. But good question. Any other women that would like to ask a question? I just want to say thank you for helping us to remember and tapping into something magical. Um, that's, that's really it. It's, it's very special. Thank you. You're most welcome. Any, anyone else? I just want to point out that uh, matriarchal matrilineal societies were uh, existed continuously and globally until about 5,000 BC. Um, so the entire um, exploration and diaspora of South Africa and worldwide um, proceeded under the, the aegis of a matriarchal society. Um, it wasn't the patriarchy that defeated the Neanderthal. We don't know why the Neanderthal disappeared. Um, it had nothing to do with jealous men. The number of genetic innovations that were uh, that we claim as our own as a human species uh, are not dated back to the same moment that uh, we can trace our single common ancestor. The mitochondrial gene is a scientific reality. But um, syntactic language is much more recent. Um, conceptual thought appears to be much more recent than that. Uh, I find your story uh, divisive and toxic, Bruce. With all due respect, I, I love you as a person, and I, I really admire your mind. But I don't see the point of telling a story like this uh, in an age that really requires a, uh, an increasing understanding of how it is that uh, we are able, you know, that requires us to see ourselves in one another and to come to an understanding and to to end the war between the sexes. I don't find it uh, helpful at all to tell a story that, first of all, doesn't even hold um, scientifically, and, and second of all, to present it to an audience that doesn't know any better. Um, so. That's very good. Um, Jess, can you bring the microphone? I don't agree with that. I guess I should probably dialogue. Excuse me. I'm not open to that. So, as a counterpoint to that, I would like to say that I appreciate your work because we live in a society that is dominated by science, which is very masculine. And the scientific paradigm, while extremely valuable, will not ever answer all of the questions for us, or at least not for a very long time, not in our lifetimes. And it's important for us to take the time to learn to imagine and to tell stories to each other that show us or that give us a paradigm to visualize where we came from, how we got here, and therefore to understand where we're going. I think that's what Bruce is creating. He's creating a form of storytelling that allows us to imagine our own stories of where we came from using whatever we know of science, not necessarily holding on to that one thing as doctrine. And um, I want to credit Michael here. I may have big chunks of the story wrong, and we may need to change it. That's the scientific method. That's why we're not doing religion. And so maybe his contribution will, will make it a, a more powerful story for us. But if it's contributed in, in a state of levity, and, and which I know it is, so we have to acknowledge that too. And are we down to? I do love you. I do love you too, Michael, of course. By definition, uh, we can do one more with their uh, Travis. Uh, I just want to make a comment. Like, I, I thought the story was beautiful, and I think one of the, the greatest powers of storytelling is how it inspires you. Not necessarily I mean, the facts. You know, it might not be necessarily true your story, but the inspiration that people get from the story is profound. And, and, and I think to, to conclude. Uh, yeah, I think this is the start of a process and there's been others doing this process of 
telling powerful stories is the way we transform our world. So maybe this is a weak story, maybe it's a powerful story. If it stays with you and you feel moved to tell it to others or to go online and research the details and maybe make it a better story, a more accurate story, or a more artistic story, I mean, it doesn't have to be all based in, in what is known. Uh, but if that story moves you to feel different about you and relationship and the future and more, I feel that that story makes you feel very optimistic. Like, whoa, look at this incredible transformation that may be coming our way and it's from women coming into, into the full balance of the equation in all aspects and it's got to be across the board and I think in a lot of ways it has to be become a matriarchal world again, period. I think the evidence is in that the guys built these thermal nuclear devices. You know what? They just lost their union card. Look at the shit they've done. Do we do we want to have an even slightly patriarchal world, or we want to try a matriarchal world for the next thousand years? My, you know where my vote will go. Sorry, the Nashi people. I'll talk to you later about that. But I, I think if it were using science, we would look at the behaviors of male, male hierarchy and look at the, the data points and we would say, hey, that structure ain't what we want anymore. It has created, I mean, it created the recent wars. I mean, if you go, go into center camp and there's this pictorial history of the last 10 years of this country, 13 years, and you see this line of presidential candidates, what bigger group of assholes, buffoons, idiots, thieves, and just basically not competent and not a heartfelt, not in tune people could you get? And they're all lined up there. So it's one of the election campaigns. There are all these guys. Do we want that? I don't want that. Get rid of that. So the only thing more powerful to come in is a total phase transition of the species where the women come back into the center. That's what I think the only thing, you know, mitochondrial Eve can come to those presidential candidates and say, oh, please. And that would be just fine, with, uh, I think, uh, for our future. So with that, I'll close the talk because we have Sri Kumari. Uh, he's probably having a cup of tea. And uh, he's going to show us the limits of male power, by the way. Male mesmeric guru power. And how you can show that a lot of that is just uh, a chimera. It's a, it's a simulation. And this is what Kumari has, has brought us with his film and with his, his lifestyle. He's showing us how he can be grievously misled, but that also he became, uh, he, he discovered a better human being, Kumari, that he could try to be. So it's a beautiful story. It's, be it's a beautiful story for our future, uh, for our past and for our future past. Thank you very much. As you can hear from the audience reaction, this story of mitochondrial Eve touched off some deep emotions and set off an interplay between male and female energies. So the story is perhaps already at work, as the women seem to embrace it. I hope they make it their own, and feel mitochondrial Eve growing within, calling them to reform the original hearth and circle and take their place for the next thousand years. One male challenging the veracity of my story was well-known and regarded speaker, composer, and artist Michael Garfield. His points about scientific inaccuracies in my rap was well-received by me. Later hanging out with him in the nearby tea house, I was introduced to the wonderful world of William Irwin Thompson, a true scholar of human origins that Michael draws much of his understanding from. Thanks to Michael, I later absorbed hours of Thompson's sweeping lectures, including one titled Civilization and the Displacement of the Feminine, which speaks directly to the themes of my story. I decided to provide you some excerpts from this magnificent talk, where Thompson chronicles how the feminine religions and community practices of the Upper Paleolithic dramatically gave way to a male-dominated world and what we now call civilization by the time of Sumer about 6,000 years ago. So Michael was right. 
matrilineal communities persisted from our origins in Africa up until the rise of the Near Eastern empires. I invite listeners to explore Thompson's books and talks online, and we will have links to these at www.levityzone.org. Let us all continue to learn in levity and use those insights to craft powerful, transformative stories for the world, which so needs to hear them now. I also want to thank Hidden Place for his properly paleolithic intro music from his album Trinumeral. And we will hear more from this wonderful artist after Professor Thompson speaks. But what's always breaking out in the, in the tablets themselves, if you look more closely at the, at the poems, is this continual explosion of the feminine power and the remembering back to the old matriarchal ways of saying, I have put you in charge. So what's kicking back and forth in all of these myths is a, is a very unstable relationship between male and female. They've just gone through a hell of a cultural change in the last couple of thousand years, and the situation has not resolved itself. And the very fact that civilization is such an untraditional way of life is what's creating even further instabilities in the whole situation. The male cycle in body time is tragic and phallic, it's tumescence and detumescence, the rise and fall of the phallus, the rise and fall of kingship, the rise and fall of cities, the rise and fall of everything in time, and that it's, uh, it's linear and climactic. Where female body time is uh, the menstrual lunar cycle and is cyclical and eternal return and rebirth so that Anana can descend into hell and go through the darkness, but she can... Uh, can descend and ascend and become uh, come whole and immortal again. So that the image for the male is tragic. Now remember when we talked way back with Lois Garon about the wounded man motif, that the images of man in the Upper Paleolithic are of wounded men or men associated uh, in difficult straits with an animal, whether it's being chased by a bear or prostrate before a bison. And I was arguing because of, of uh, an awareness of these mythic patterns from later that what we have fully developed in this story uh, has its roots in a pattern way back in the Upper Paleolithic. So man builds the cities, but woman triumphs over his actions. Lilith will always dance in the ruins of whatever city comes. So Ur goes, Nineveh, Babylon, Rome, you know, London, New York, whatever. All cities rise up for a time and then they perish. So that the dead man before the female bison is an image that is repeated again with the image of the man who is found with the crone of death in the vulture shrine in Chatelhoyek. And that image is again played upon and picked up by this image of Demutzi, who is immolated by the demons of the, uh, of the goddess. So the male gods displace the female, but man is still the dying animal. And so the, the relationship is that man begins to have power in the conscious sense that there is the constellation of an ego and there's a constellation of this island civilization surrounded by the unconscious but all the chthonic power is still in the soil in the uh, in the eternal ways of the matriarchy and is still very much where for man the feminine contains his unconscious and the feminine contains the power of life and death. The feminine contains the images of beauty and terror joined together, just as Yeats says in his poem, Easter 1916, a terrible beauty is born. Or Rilke says in uh, the Duino Elegies, <clears throat> but beauty is nothing but the beginning of terror which so serenely disdains to destroy us. So you have this whole sense that for the male psyche, the beautiful feminine anima figure is beautiful, transcendental, terrifying, and immolating and the archetype of the immolated male figure is, um, is Demutzi. So what you have then is the, um, the urban revolution is the male revolution. It's the displacement of the feminine, it's the demotion of the, of the great mother god, it's the rise of specialization, class stratification, warfare, militarism, hydraulic civilization, large uh, urban projects, and it probably comes about because of the hunting band reconstituting itself as the trading band, and the trading band beginning to move into an economic nexus that's quite different from the blood relationships of the, of the tribe and the great mother. But at any rate, uh, once the displacement is overcome, it creates a split and a, a division in the psyche, and it's one 
that we've been living with ever since because we are still basically civilized. Hopefully we're now in the process of growing beyond civilization, but more about that later. At any rate, what seems to have happened in Chattelhoyek is that the religion of 15,000 years of the Great Mother constellated itself into, say, a priesthood or a priestesshood, and it became conservative and located in place. And the hunters who were used to wandering around shifted since hunting was no longer the base of their society, the food was coming from agriculture, shifted into trade, basically through obsidian. And as they began to move away from blood relationships, what was a disadvantage on one level of order at Chital Hiyuk begins to be an advantage at a higher level of order as they move towards civilization. And suddenly, the conservatism of the woman places herself in a position that's inflexible and rigid and sees herself moving out of power. So that in, say, Elise Bolding's book, um, The Underside of History, she shows the power of matrilineal society to deal effectively with small village life, but it doesn't have the complex specialization to deal with the problems of the polis or civilization. And so eventually, woman's power is displaced and she ends up uh, in the home. In a sense, the, the religious aspect of that is that when woman is staying in, in Chattelhoyek and not moving into this other trading nexus, that she's beginning to be locked into the position that woman's role is conservative, her place is in the home, not in the abstract uh, nexus of trade, economics, and civilization. At any rate, when the men widen their horizons and escape women in the town and move into new wealth, crafts, specialization, they move into the city. And then the city begins to be uh, this whole new kind of dynamism that by a complex feedback system just gets spiraling larger and larger and larger until finally you have warfare taking over from religion and by the time you reach the Assyrians the basis of civilization is not on religion, the basis of civilization is just sheer terror and force. So it seems to be a pattern that we've seen even in industrial society that woman is conservative from the point of view of man almost a reactionary force, a force of the unconscious and man is the, uh, the phallic kind of dominant god so that as the, the relationship shifts, the woman reacts with all the power of the unconscious against the very fragile consciousness of the male. So the man may come on strong with power and militaristic force, but the male psyche itself is very fragile. And there is a quality by which male energy and militarism is really terrified of the feminine energy and terrified of even beyond that of the unconscious, terrified of the universe, terrified of nature. And so the disruption of what had been a harmonious blend of the opposites of yin and yang and for 15,000 years in the religion of the upper Paleolithic and may be consummately expressed in the astrological civilization of the megalithic sites. That may be in a sense the real flowering of this culture. That, that situation, when it's disrupted, creates the pathological war of the sexes and creates the violent disassociations and violent alienation that we know of civilization and uh, especially say from Marx's critiques of civilization. Then you begin to get in a sense a situation where woman is seen as a threat and the increasing role of civilization will be the domestication of women. First you have the domestication of plants, then you have the domestication of animals, and then you have the domestication of women. So you can say that civilization is the domestication of women. And it's no accident why the woman's revolution has tried to empower the return of the feminine by going back to prehistory and rewriting history totally to prepare for another culture that won't be civilized at all. We see ourselves changing away from the marines and male machismo and the whole Pisces to becoming long-haired and soft and androgynous and men getting in touch with their feminine nature and feeling and all the rest of it. And this is coming not because we've been conquered and subjugated, but because we're undergoing a cultural change and cultural evolution in a psychic sort of way, a change in the constellations of archetypes. So Jung and Neumann would argue for a kind of progression in that, uh, in that way.